Well, good afternoon, and for some of you, good morning, and welcome to today's webinar on service learning linked to curriculum through the Common Core State Standards. So my name is Sue Valdez, and I am the Chief Learning Officer here at the National Youth Leadership Council. And so that I don't forget to do it later, here's my email address, svaldez at nylc.org. So if when we're done you have follow-up questions that you'd like to ask or comments about the webinar, that would be very helpful for us to keep improving these sessions and just to continue collaborating afterwards. I wanted to give you just a little bit of my background. I have been an educator for a number of years. I've held roles from the classroom teaching both at the early childhood as well as the elementary school level. I've done a little bit of teaching in the middle school and high school and I've done a lot of coaching, instructional coaching and leadership coaching of principals and superintendents. I was a principal and a superintendent as well. And so I definitely have teacher eyes on while I speak and while I deliver and develop webinars and other presentations that I do. So where my blind sides are outside of the classroom, I'm hoping that you all can fill those in a little bit more broadly. I most recently, before joining the National Youth Leadership Council, spent about four years working with a team on improving rigor and relevance in instruction in the classroom. And it's an absolutely perfect fit between service learning and high rigor and high relevance, which also links beautifully to the Common Core state standards. So that will be the focus for today. So as we're getting started here, if you could all please look in the chat box and put type your name and the role, actually your name will come up I suppose when you hit send, uh, so your, the role that you play in the school where you work or the community where you live and specifically what is it that lit up for you in this webinar? Why did you choose to join us today? So while you are filling those things out, and we'll come back to the chat box, I wanted to talk just briefly. This is the goal for today. and. Certainly you can read it, but I specifically wanted to focus on instructional shifts that needed to be made and the critical thinking skills that students need to have to solve real world problems and the criticality of that in the, in the way that we deliver rigorous and relevant instruction. So the agenda for today, we're going to be looking at K-12 service learning standards of quality practice, and particularly we're going to be focusing on links to curriculum, which is one of the eight standards of practice. And then we're going to look at the instructional shifts required of, of teachers implementing the Common Core State Standards, and we'll make specific links between service learning and the Common Core. So what I see here is community coordinator in a school for ELLs. I see some folks, non-formal educating, educator in Trout Unlimited. So you've got lots of different clients. I see um, assist teachers in the classroom to manage work-based learning programs. So it looks like, and then we've got, you know, work in schools and teachers in classrooms and the whole team down in Guilford County. So they're working directly with students in classrooms as well. So it looks like there's um, folks from across the board here. So welcome. Character education and service learning, service learning coordinators, etc. So it's a it looks like a great audience and you all can certainly add your ideas along the way because I don't have you know, all the wisdom and knowledge. It's 
spread across all of us. So thank you for joining us again. So along these same lines, I wanted to get a sense of where you stand with your knowledge and background with the K-12 service learning standards for quality practice. So I just made these three, you're just learning or you know them, you've started working with them or you've been working with them and implementing them in your classroom for years. And while you, the, the poll is in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. So if you just click on beginner, intermediate or advanced, it will start shifting our numbers for us. And I did put this web link in here, which Marcus will put in the chat box, so you can certainly download them directly if you don't already have them. The K-12 Service Learning Standards for Quality Practice were developed as a team that was convened by the National Youth Leadership Council in 2008, and they identify eight standards of quality practice for service learning implementation. And so you can certainly see what the eight of them are and the webinar series that we are running all year this year focuses on those eight standards. And as I mentioned before, this one focuses on one of those standards called link to curriculum. So it looks like we've got some advanced folks, but by and large, almost half, are beginners to quality service learning and to service learning practice. So that's helpful for me. And to understand, I will try to make links that make sense in spite of this being brand new to you. And I would recommend downloading those service learning standards when you get a moment. So this is one of the standards, it's called Link to Curriculum, and you can see it's that service learning is in intentionally used as an instructional strategy. And the four components underneath that, you can see what they are, that the learning goals are articulated clearly, and that whatever the academic curriculum, it's linked to the projects that students implement. So. Number four, I would say, is the trickiest one and the one maybe the difference between doing a really good job with linking to curriculum and doing an exceptional job in linking to curriculum with your projects is that the school board policies and student records actually reflect service learning and the links to curriculum. And an example of that, I'm going to refer to a team that's on the line, is the Guilford County folks, they actually have a diploma that is linked to service learning. So students earn those credits towards service learning practice. It's an example where policies and student records reflect exceptional service learning as part of the curricular day. So as I think about service learning, and in particular to make the bridge for those that are newer to service learning, I thought about project-based learning. And I'm doing this particularly for a couple of reasons. I think that even if you're new to service learning, project-based learning may be a strategy with which you are more familiar. And additionally, it's specifically called out in the Common Core State Standards as a strategy to consider in the implementation. So again, it's a pretty good fit here. And I highlighted some of the key terms in what stage one out of four stages, where the teacher is designing this project. There is a supplement to the curriculum, but it's not central to it. Maybe a single discipline is covered. It's either math or science or social sciences, etc. And the real world impact is somewhat incidental. And then key here is the teacher's role as a director of instruction. So as you think about these characteristics of a stage one project-based pro, um, program, what, might, what examples might you give? And again, in the chat box, if you could 
type some examples that you might have, stage one, and just, you know, stage one, and give an example of a project that you may have used or seen or that you want to try. And while you're doing that, I want to suggest that it's not a bad thing to be in stage one of project-based learning. It, you've got to start somewhere on the continuum. If students are participating in projects already, you're well on the way to authentic instruction and great learning. So it's not that stage one is bad, it's just the first step on the path. As we move along to stage two, again, you'll see some of the differences I highlighted in black. Students are given choices. So now instead of the teacher designing all of these things, students have the opportunity to weigh in on what processes and what products they're going to participate in. And it's the foundation for differentiated instruction where the teacher sets some guidelines and parameters but the students are giving cho given choices with regard specifically to product and process. Now you can cross discipline so maybe you're doing a social studies project but there's a lot of language arts infused or you're doing a science project with a lot of math infusion and I would suggest as we branch into the Common Core, that anytime you can infuse math and language arts into any project that you do when you're crossing disciplines, you'll make some great leaps towards uh, service learning that links to the Common Core State Standards. The other big difference here, and again, I know you'll start seeing where service learning comes in, you have real world impact built in. It's intentional in the design. When you look at stage three, the big changes happen, as you can see, that now you may have multiple disciplines, but in this case, you absolutely will cross disciplines. And although it's not in black, you'll see it could include many planners. And this is maybe one of the challenges that you're thinking about. We'll talk a little bit more about challenges later, but you need to plan with other grade levels and other subject area teachers in order to plan across multiple disciplines. And here, the students are designing the projects. They are absolutely focused on having an impact in the real world. And the work is constructivist and it's complex. So it's rigorous, it's relevant because the students are designing the projects, and it's hands-on. And here, although there are assessment targets that the district may have, authentic assessments are included more broadly. So to what degree does the project actually provide an assessment mechanism for students to demonstrate mastery? And as you'll see, the biggest shift for the instructor is that now, instead of directing, you're facilitating learning. And that's a big shift. And finally, we get to stage four. So while I go through stage four, I'm going to ask those of you who wrote that you are intermediate and advanced, please take a look in the chat box and put an example of a service learning project that you think was maybe the finest one you've seen or done. And I'm going to walk through stage four for everybody, but for the advanced folks online and the intermediate folks online who've implemented service learning before, can you please put some examples of a project you've done into the chat box? So here in stage four, which is the highest of the four stage of, of all the stages in project-based learning continuum, the teacher is designing the infrastructure. In other words, they may say, this is going to be, you're going to have an opportunity to do technology, to use technology, you're going to use journals. So some of the basic structure of the project the teacher is designing. However, the students are designing the project, the essential question, the focus, and the goals. And inherent in the project 
is a real world impact by design and it's a whole school program. So now a theme across an entire building that's implemented in numerous different classrooms across numerous different disciplines, this would be stage four. At this point, it's more like whole school reform where project-based learning becomes the foundation of a whole school reform. And you'll see the students are doing the alignment between the projects and those assessment targets. In order to do this, you need very much to have students understand what the Common Core State Standards goals are that are being implemented. So community impact, re, you know, real world impact, where the whole school is involved, where the students are designing the projects, and the students know what the standards are that they are looking to master so that they can tell you how they're going to demonstrate that mastery. And here, the teacher becomes a facilitator and an advisor. So as an example, maybe a student is looking in a specific area and doing some research online, and the teacher recognizes that there are links to other pieces of the curriculum that the student may not have noticed, or that there are other resources available in the school or in the community or online in a search, and they maybe point students in that example. So here, I, you can see some of the examples. High school students designed a rain garden connecting environmental science, chemistry, design, technology, and math, where the impact was conservation and stormwater management. And they worked with the local metropolitan sewage district. So you can see um, in Julie's example, uh, that's Chelsea's example, sorry, from Chelsea's example, a great connection into the community. Or here from Julie, a high school art teacher integrated a project into her course that aligned an existing course objective of creating portraits, partnering with an organization that takes photographs in African orphanages, and her students made the portraits of those students to send them back as a positive memory of their childhood. So social studies, African current events, art, technology, meaningful, connected to the, to the curriculum in wonderful ways. So I'm going to ask you to read through these and get whatever ideas out of here that uh, help you to design great project-based learning. And I'm wondering if those, for those that are expert in service learning, as several of you are, if you see connections between project-based learning stage four and service learning that meets the eight standards of quality practice. And to the extent that you do, if you could please now click on the little box at the top left-hand corner of your screen that has the T in it, it's a text tool, and if you click on the T and you place it into the slide, and we'll show you what that, how that might look. Here's an example. So if you type in here what similarities or differences, not the arrow tool, um, which also will indicate that this is you who said that, so that's kind of nice, but click the T, the little box with the T in it, to the right of the arrow box, and then type a similarity or a difference. What do you see as similarities and differences between project-based learning and service learning? And if the text tool is giving you problem, you can see on our screen where the text tool is highlighted, if that's giving you a problem, uh, you can type it into the chat box as well. The, a similarity is this, or a difference is that. Yes, yeah, so this is a great example that um, somebody just added to the similarities, that great project-based learning and great service learning provides 
meaningful service. Now I will say project-based learning is meaningful learning. I'm not sure that it serves by design, but ideally it would. And yes, definitely community engagement. So if you have great community engagement, then you will have meaningful service if it's valuable to the students and it's valuable to the community, which for those of you that are new to service learning, meaningful service is actually one of the other eight standards. Yes, that it's hands-on in both cases, has valuable outcomes, it's an authentic learning opportunity. These are all great. That student voice is present. So again, for those are, of you who are new to service learning, student voice is another one of the eight standards. And somebody wrote, project-based learning does not necessarily have to address a community concern or issue. And I'd say that's absolutely uh, one of the differences. So as you think great partnerships, again, partnerships is another one of the eight standards of quality, of, uh, quality practice and service learning. And I think it's probably underlying here, but in both cases, it's linked to the curriculum. And that's, I think it comes with an authentic learning opportunity but specifically that it's linked to the educational objectives and outcomes that the district has outlined. So as you think through, um, again, service learning, when, and for those of you that have not yet implemented, from what you've seen from stage four project-based learning or your previous experience with project-based learning, and with service learning, what might be the benefits or the challenges of implementing service learning, in particular service learning that links to curricular content standards? So again, using your text tool, if you could type some challenges and benefits of linking service learning to the curriculum, and while you're typing, I'm going to read a couple more of these great examples. So, oh, Julie continues that afterwards, the students moved the portrait project, began a pen pal relationship at, with the students and did collections of needed items and sent them back to the children in Africa. So you can see it's Long, that's duration, what we would call duration and intensity, that the project has long-term meaningful benefits to both those who are here executing the project and for those children in Africa who are being served. This says, I ran a three-month program that helped Hmong students write a book over the summer. Many were most were English, English as a second language students, and they gained one year of academic reading increase. So again, this is a, an example where you're writing curriculum with the students and the students are writing a book. So they have great, both so maybe social studies, I don't know what the content of the book was so whatever the book content was would be content knowledge in that area and then obviously the language arts connection students make real life connection with learning as a benefit time i don't know if time is a benefit or a challenge um, i will say that you if a, a project is well designed you will actually save time because you're linking curriculum across the area and you're not just focused on a particular standard or a particular content area, you're touching many standards and many content areas at the same time. So money to complete projects. And that is a challenge or it can be a challenge. Most of the projects with which we work, either we have students help to raise funds for the projects 
or we write very meaningful grants to get the community to participate. And one of the wonderful things about service learning is that because you are benefiting the community, you may have a better chance of getting community funds involved. Some of us are writing over the same area, and I'm having a little bit of trouble reading some of them. Uh, one of the challenges is proving that it helps academic achievement. And so this, I have to say, the critical piece there is the curricular link. So one of the ways that we can all advance the field of service learning is by doing very deliberate connection to the curricular links so that you can prove more readily that there are links to academic achievement. Somebody is um, no noting that it's difficult to see what you're writing because the type is rather small, and I am noticing that there are different font sizes. I don't know how to change the font size. But feel free, certainly, it says, Jill says you can change the text size. Um, Jill, if you could type in the, in the chat box how people do that, that might be helpful. And, and also, certainly feel free, a drop-down box with text size. Oh, it's, it's a screen that you can zoom to see the font, what you're seeing. So there are some options here. I see other challenges is the alignment, and I agree. Uh, that's probably the most difficult challenge with service learning curricular linking. And you'll see that is a, exactly the same thing farther downstream. Then it's hard to uh, correct, prove that it's got impact on academic achievement. But the more linked that the service learning project is to the curricular focus, the easier that proof will be. The benefits, leveraging resources with community partners, again, it takes time, right? It's unfamiliar to many teachers. And this is why I started with project-based learning, because I do think it's a little bit um, more familiar to folks. Community connections are created as a benefit. The ownership of students in learning. So I don't know who just wrote that comment, but I want to tell you that this is the single reason that I said yes to the National Youth Leadership Council when they asked me to come work in the education arena here with them. Because in my eyes, the only team of people who are going to be able to fix whatever learning gaps we have are the students. And the only way they're going to do that if they feel ownership of their learning. So I mentioned before the rigor relevance model, that is what the relevance component speaks to. And you will never get to rigor if the learning is not relevant. And the way to make students feel that they can own the project is for them to design it, which makes the project relevant to them. So lack of collegial or professional support. And so I want to suggest there are 50 folks on the phone today, and we have thousands of service learning professionals across the states and internationally. So please look into the Generator School Network and uh, Marcus will put the web link in there. It's an online community of professionals and youth who are dedicated to implementing service learning. Okay, well, these are wonderful. So if you move, we're going to move along. And I'm going to say... That link to curriculum and everything that you all wrote about, it's difficult to align. We can't prove that it impacts student achievement. I think this is the link, is the common core, or whatever state standards you are using. 
So the website is here for those of you that haven't been out on it, www.corestandards.org. And again, Marcus has typed it into the, into the chat box. Susan wrote that the chat, there's a challenge that there are too many electives in the upper grades. And I think that that's something that um, maybe we can discuss offline. So Susan, please feel free to send me an email and we will post this as a community conversation on the GSN so that others can participate and we can help work together to resolve that issue. So as you look at the, the U.S., and I've got the, the standard, the, the assessments here, as we talked earlier about project-based learning and the criticality of designing great assessments. However, there is also this standard platform of assessments. And if you would, next to the T tool in the top left-hand corner of your screen, to the left of that is the arrow uh, icon you'll see. And if you could just click on that arrow icon and click somewhere in the state where you live. And while you're doing that, I'll talk a little bit about these two consortia. So PARC and Smarter Balance are the two national consortia who will be responsible for administering the statewide exams that test mastery of the Common Core. And the national design is that those, stand, those, exe those exams, those assessments that are both summative and formative start this year. And everybody's in a mad race to implement them. And there are some differences. So you'll see um, if you're in a red state and we don't have too many in red states. It looks like the North Carolina team. Uh, so the Smarter Balanced Consortia, at the moment, the biggest difference between Park and Smarter Balance is that Smarter Balance has computer adaptive tests. So like the SAT and the ACTs, um, the test gets harder, the questions get harder when students get a right answer and get easier when students get an easier um, miss it, the questions get easier when a student misses the question. So it gets more, the exam gets more challenging the more questions they get right and less challenging when they get them wrong. The other thing is that Smarter Balance, as you might imagine, because they have a computer adaptive test, they're doing a little bit better job, in my opinion, of accommodating language learning students and special needs students. For that reason, several states have adapted and are adopting both. So you can see, for instance, North Dakota, um, Colorado, some of these other uh, states that are Georgia. They haven't quite settled on one or the other. But by the time the testing comes up at the end of this school year, those that say both will need to pick one or the other. And of course, there are some who say none. So Texas, Virginia, uh, Nebraska have not adopted the Common Core. Neither has Alaska, although one district in Alaska has individually decided that they were going to adopt the Common Core. In Minnesota, we've adopted at the state level only the language arts Common Core. And so we're not adopting, we're not aligning with one of the assessment consortia. So again, if you are in a state that's either Smarter Balance or Park, or if you're in one that says both, you can go to those websites. You can just Google Smarter Balanced or Park and look at what those assessments are if you have not already started to do so. And We've got um, Susan, who I believe, believe is in Costa Rica. Um, they're using Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. And I'm not sure what the, I'm not sure what the assessments look like there. 
So again, Susan, more great things for us to discuss moving forward. So as you look at the Common Core State Standards and the adoption of them, if you could please in the poll in the bottom right, indicate is your school, district, or state in the pre-planning stage, and I don't know that I got these right, I just picked these four, initial conversations are taking place, there's some planning that's in place, or maybe you're piloting the content and the instructional strategies that are being recommended, or maybe you're piloting assessments already. I feel like I'm doing a, a national election or something. With 39% with of the votes <laughs> tallied, we have um, about 17% of the folks are in phase one. So you're looking at the instructional strategies and the content, which is helpful for us today since <laughs> Common Core State Standards linkages to service learning are all about the instructional strategies. But it looks like some folks are still in the pre-planning stage or in the planning stages, and some are actually testing. So that's great. And I think that just any small step towards implementing Common Core would be great. And to the degree that you want support in implementing Common Core, service learning is a great fit, and we're happy to help you think through that process. So here's the mission of the Common Core State Standards. It defines specifically what students are expected to learn. They are robust and relevant to the real world, and they focus on college and career readiness. And you'll see specifically one of the things that it doesn't state is the learning strategies, the teaching strategies. So the pedagogy is left up to us. And Two things that the Common Core does speak to is that it particularly recommends cross-curricular instruction and project-based learning is specifically called out. The other thing that's called out is um, integration of technology. So again, as students do research online, create demonstration of their projects, through technological programs, the technology component, which is part of the mission of the Common Core, also comes through. So looking specifically at the instructional shifts in the language arts, and I don't need to read through these, you can take a look at them, we're going to be focusing on particularly those that are the most directly connected to to, the, to uh, service learning, primarily the focus on informational text, building knowledge across the disciplines, and getting answers from text. So we're going to look at those as part of that relevance and rigor. So these are the three on which we're going to focus the most. You need to have students be able to build knowledge through content-rich nonfiction information text. So once you connect to the real world and solving problems in the real world, you can't help but meet that instructional shift of, of the common core. And that the reading and the writing comes from evidence from the text. And I think somebody said, and I, it might be on the, the MYLC website, as well in a video. If you read about something, you become knowledgeable in it. But if you act on something that you're reading, you can't help but 
address, be, maybe become the scientist and have the evidence to prove that what you read and what you practice, then you can write about. And so it's a great, it's a great link. And I will speak briefly to academic vocabulary. If a student is looking into the, as an example, the sewage district, there's gonna, there will be academic text, academic vocabulary that's specific to that discipline or to that community and exposure to that kind of complex academic vocabulary is called for in these shifts in the language arts. So these are just some basics that reading and writing across the curriculum, obviously if you're doing great service learning, you are doing great project-based cross-curricular investigation, you will be reading and writing across the curriculum. And in the early grades, about a 50-50 balance between literary and informational text, which is far more informational text than we traditionally have done with our K-5 kids. But once you get to middle school and high school, it's a huge focus, 70 to 80 percent of the text in college level and workforce training. Again, as I mentioned, shifting away from the narrative, everything based in the textual evidence. And I want to say this is a great example of close reading where instead of just scanning and skimming for basic understanding, they need to deeply understand the text that they're reading so that they can create knowledge into their projects. And this last one speaks to that academic vocabulary that I was speaking about before. I want to say that in Lexile complexity, we've measured somewhere between two and 300 points in a Lexile when we graduate students historically in 12th grade at reading level, they're two to 300 Lexile points below what is required of them, demanded in their language arts reading skills for the college or career level. So it's important to note that the, the goal is to have students reading sign at significantly higher levels by the time they graduate 12th grade. Looking into the math, here are the six different focuses of the sh instructional shifts. And again, we're going to focus most closely on three umbrellas of these, but you can certainly read through them. Deep understanding, so an application. So deeply understanding the content so that then they can apply their math appropriately. But I would say deep understanding and application in any subject would be appropriate here. It happens to be specifically called out in the shift in mathematics. So looking at focus, and this is focus on standards, and again, great link to the Common Core. So I think somebody had mentioned before about the time element. And certainly the Common Core, what they're saying is we don't need to go an inch deep and a mile wide. We need to go an inch wide and a mile deep. And it's the kind of learning that's available to students through service learning because they're going to dig into a particular issue and a particular topic. And they're going to get very deep knowledge and they're going to be able to apply their mathematics, their language arts, their science skills, et cetera, into the real world. Coherence. And again, I think I mentioned earlier in project-based learning that you're going to focus across grades, maybe get a school-wide reform sort of model. And so it's less important to cover everything and more important to cover very deeply across the grades one topic so that students can see 
links across subjects and across grades. And the last one is rigor. And so a, maybe the best fit is rigor that students, it's meta thinking. So students don't know how to get an answer. They know they're understanding the deep concepts. Therefore, they're able to apply those concepts into the real world. And they're using math in any content area. I will point out the procedural skill and fluency. This is not the kind of thing that they may learn in service learning. This is where classroom direct instruction, you don't want a seventh grader figuring out six times six. You want them to already have those things mastered in order to be able to get to deep learning on the other side. I will say that um, in, as we wrap up instructional shifts, that when I was in the classroom and when I coach teachers, I ask them to put the standards that are being learned in these projects, post them in the classroom so that students understand this is the mastery they're being expected to be able to demonstrate. And that they're understanding that the work that they're doing is connecting school into their lives and into the real world. And this study in 2009, and it does speak to the question earlier about getting the links between service learning and academic excellence, that high quality service learning will provide the collaboration, the thinking skills, and the problem solving skills that the Common Core requires and that the authors and advocates of Common Core expected. So along the continuum of service learning, again, you might focus on one or more of those standards of the eight quality standards and figure out which ones will help you implement quality service learning so that you can make those links back to student achievement. Finally, there's a, a video I want to play for you. It's an example of great uh, project-based learning, which I believe is great service learning, and we'll show you some links to the Common Core. So while you're watching this video and getting whatever ideas come to mind here, it comes from Edutopia. It's that you can Google in Edutopia the kinetic conundrum if you want to see the video again. And maybe take a look at project-based learning, service learning, and common core. Have those lenses on while you're watching the video. So thank you all very much. Have a wonderful day.